10.3, really a continuation of 10.2. Um, we're going to continue with the different types of graphical representations um, that we can use for displaying data. Um, we encountered quite a few different graphical representations in 10.2. Um, this just continues that discussion. And there's a few more. Um, and again, just like we were talking about in 10.2, not every graph is appropriate for every set of data. There are sets of data that are just more conducive and more appropriate for certain kinds of graphs. So for example, we just talked about the circle graphs, right? Circle graphs are a really good part to whole representation. They don't do a great job of showing, or showing comparisons of data. Can they? Well, yeah, I mean, you can look at a circle graph and you can compare data, but they're not the best representation for comparing data. So we're going to take a look at a couple more in this section. The first one is called a line graph, not to be confused with a line plot. I know. We had dot line plots, but this is a line graph. These are line segments connecting one point of data to the next, typically showing the trend of a variable over time. And I want you to think, connect the dots. A line graph is not a line. It's a combination or a, a compilation, really, of a set of line segments. So there's a lot of data that we actually see presented in line graphs. Um, one of the real common ones you'll see is things like um, stock market stuff. You know what I'm talking about? How it does this sort of like bouncing all over the place, and it's all line segments that are connecting one month to the next or one year to the next, right? So they're showing a change in something over time. <clears throat> so here's an example of one, the, the time, and this one is not time in years or months, but it's time in the days of the week. So as a learning specialist tracked the average reported study times of her students, create a line graph for the data she tracked. So this is the amount of time that a student has spent studying based on the day of the week. So Monday, one and a half hours, Tuesday, 1.75, all the way to Sunday. And I think I have, no, I don't. Um, all right, so we'll just do it from here. Um, we're going to create an X, Y axis. So just like we would do, we're doing back in the last section for like our bar graphs. But the X, Y axis is going to be displaying, in this case, the days of the week on the bottom. And all the ones that we did in the last section had frequency along the side. This isn't frequency. This is the number of hours spent studying. There's actually more than just somebody says, yes, I studied, or no, I didn't. And I'm not counting the number of students who said yes or no, right? I'm actually talking about a numerical data value. So these are the hours spent studying. And you'll notice none of them, well, I'm going to say none of them, but most of them are not whole number values, right? They're portions of an hour, um, everywhere from a quarter, right? The 0.25 hours is our smallest value here, up to our largest value, which is actually two hours. So when we're creating our, um, like our data distribution along the left-hand side, we have to take into consideration what the data is actually distributed around, right? So like if I made marks for the values one, two, three, four, it doesn't make sense for this data. But what would make sense for this data to do every quarter of an hour? Does that make sense? So my hash marks are actually gonna represent one-fourth, one-half, three-fourths, and one. One and a quarter, one and a half, one and three-quarters, and two. And I've chosen to only label the whole number of values. You can label more of them if you wish. It's not going to hurt anything if you'd like to. I'm going to give myself just a little more space. Okay, that wasn't what I meant to do. It's being awfully particular on me today. Um, but they're going to be roughly evenly distributed in terms of um, their spacing. Roughly evenly spaced. Um, the same thing is going to be true down here on bottom. I'm going to have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I'm just going to label it by the letter of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to put a bunch of dots on here. So for example, on Monday, the person says they studied one and a half hours. So that would be right here. On Tuesday, it's 1.75 hours. So just slightly higher. On Wednesday, it's 0.75 hours. On Thursday, it's two hours. Because you know everybody does tests on Fridays, right? And on Friday, I think that they're lying, but they say they're studying a quarter of an hour. I don't know very many people who study on Fridays. I didn't as a student, and I was a good student, so I don't think that's true, but we can pretend. Well, the next one is also 0.25 hours on Saturday, probably also a lie. And then on Sunday, one and a half, because they're making up for all the lies that they told over the weekend, right? Mm -hmm, pretty much. Y'all know it's true, right? There you go. Okay, whatever it is, we've got a collection of dots. Now, what we're going to do with our collection of dots is we're going to connect the dots. And we have to go in order, right? We've got to connect the Monday to the Tuesday to the Wednesday to the Thursday and so forth with line segments. So they should be fairly straight. They don't have to be like ruler specifically straight, but they should look straight. So we got Monday to Tuesday, Tuesday to Wednesday, Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday, Friday to Saturday, and Saturday to Sunday. Something like that. My Friday to Saturday doesn't look very convincing as straight, but it should be. straight it's just not horizontal okay that's it that's a line graph except that I'm missing a title I need a title so this is what hours what our studying so hours or you could even say time just in general time spent studying I'll say by students if you don't want to say that, that's fine. And of course, this is self-reported data, so there's always a level of probably inaccuracy with that too, right? Yeah. Here, we good with that? Time spent studying. No, because we've got the labeling on the bottom, so we know that part. If you did, it wouldn't hurt anything, Emily. It's just not necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, you ready for the next one? Okay. The next one is called a scatter plot. <clears throat> a scatter plot is often used when a relationship between variables cannot be easily depicted even by a broken line. And we have a massive table next, don't we? We do. Coach Lewis kept track of the vertical jump heights of his starters over eight years. So vertical jump height means, means you stand still and you jump straight up. Right? How high you can jump, all right? So like a high jump kind of thing. How high they can jump. So we see the first starter, the second starter, the third starter, the fourth starter, the fifth starter. These are not necessarily the same person from year to year, obviously. Hopefully none of these people were in high school for eight years, right? These are just the top five people on his team, okay? And he's measuring or trying to measure or look at how that's changing over time. So what we're asked to do is to draw a scatter plot. Sorry, it's over here. I don't even have a title for it on there. Draw a scatter plot for the data. What kind of association is there for the data? Okay, so I actually have a grid on mine. If you want to get graph paper and use it, fantastic. If you want to draw your own, that's fine. If you want to, just for the few that you might want it for, print something off online, you can find gridded, gridded um, you know, diagrams online and just print them off for that. So if that helps you to feel like you've got a better understanding or a better measure of what you're doing, that's great. But you don't have to. Um, so here is a grid on mine. You've got no grid on your paper. I apologize for that. But we're going to actually create a graph, much like what we did before, with a bunch of dots. It's just that the dots themselves are going to be more massive, number one, because there's more information, but also because a, a line graph doesn't make sense for this data. The data that we're actually being given in this kind of a situation just doesn't work like the, glass, the last graph did. So we're going to have our sets of uh, axes here. And we need to represent things over time. 
So what do you suppose goes along our x-axis or our horizontal axis? The years. These are going to be our years on bottom. And it starts with the year, I don't even know, what did it say? 2002, and it goes to the year 2008. So I'm going to measure 2002 as being two marks away from the beginning, all right? So that's 2002. <coughs> and then I have 2004. What do I have? Three, four, all the way to eight. Okay, so 2004, I'm going to mark them off in twos, six, eight, so forth. So this is 2002. Give myself a little more space. This is 2004, 2006, and 2008. So I've marked every other year. I don't even need that last hash, last hash mark. I'm no longer on the. Uh... That's better. So those are my years. Um, what's going to go on the left-hand side, like the vertical side? What am I going to be putting there? What types of values? Anybody know? The heights, the jumping heights, right? So let me label that first. These would be our vertical jump heights. How are those measured? What unit? In inches, right. So we need to record that it's in inches. Now, it's valuable to recognize that what I'm actually doing, by the way I've set this up, is that my vertical axis, my y-axis, is representing what year? Based on the way I did my hash marks, what year is represented by my vertical axis? Is two, the way I did it is two, the year 2000, because I skipped two little hash marks before I made my first one right for the year 2001, 2002. So my vertical axis is the year 2000. We're going to come back to why that's an important feature in a minute. Okay, but just recognize that I made my axis like that. That's what I chose. 2000 seems a reasonable place for my axis to be the year zero. I'm measuring since the year 2000. However, it does not make sense that my horizontal axis is a jump height of zero because none of these jump heights are anywhere close to zero, right? So I don't want my horizontal axis to be a jump height of zero. That doesn't make sense. But it also doesn't make sense to sort of just jump in with, you know, 62 or something like that. So here's what we do in order to show that we have had a break in our values. We actually make a break in the graph. So it looks something like this. So what that tells the reader of your graph, basically, is that the horizontal axis is not a jump height of zero. I'm starting somewhere else. And in particular, I need to make sure that I'm at least starting where I've got all my data showing. So what's the smallest value? I, th I think it's 62. No, 60. I see a 60. Is there anything smaller up there? Is there a 58? Where's the 58? Oh, yep, it's a typo on my screen. There is, there's a 58 right here. Yours says 58, so mine said 68. Okay, good eyes, good eyes. Hopefully the rest of them are the same. We're going to pretend. <laughs> okay, 58 then, yeah? Is 58 our smallest? What's our largest value? 77? So here's our smallest, and there's our largest. So my vertical axis needs to include values from 58 up to 77. Does that sound good? Okay. So over here, I will simply start with 58. And the way I think, let me see if I can count them enough. I don't know how many I have. Let's just try it. I think I can do one per value on my, on my axis. So here's 59, 60, and I'll call it 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 
970, 71, 72, not going to work. 73, 74, we need three more. Hmm. Need more space. All right, so we're going to make this. All right. Seventy six, and I've got seventy seventh top. Fantastic. All right, use my whole screen. Okay, we're gonna put a bunch of dots. That's our goal. Bunches and bunches of dots. So every single data value on this little sheet of paper, right? We're gonna put it on there. So for instance, the year two thousand, I have sixty, I have fifty eight, sixty, sixty two, sixty three, sixty five. So down here, I had fifty eight. 60, oh my goodness, they're not all measuring what I do wrong. I suck, I shifted it and they didn't line up again. Let me get the shift right. Okay, 58, 60, 62, 63, and 65. I have five dots in the year 2002. Is something wrong, Alicia? Are you okay? Yep. Okay. Is everybody okay with my dots? You know I manipulated my graph a bit. All right, the next year, 2003, I have 67, 65, 64. So here's 67, 65, 64, 66, and 62. And then in the year 04, I have 67, 68, 66, 65, 64. All right, in the year 05, I have 68. 70, 67, 66, 65, and then in the year 06, I have 70, 68, 67, 69, and 66. 2007, I have 74. Who got somebody jumping tall up there? 72. 73, 70, and 69. And then in the year 08, I have 77, 75, 72, 71, and 70. Something like that. Does y'all look like that, roughly? Maybe yours is more spread out. Had so much more screen, I should have spread it out more. Sorry about that. All right, first let's answer the question that's asked online um, or in the notes that is not on my screen. The question that's asked is what kind of association is there? Okay, so here's what an association means. Association means as we go from left to right, does the trend appear to go upward or does the trend appear to go downward? So how does this trend appear to be moving? Upward. And so we call that a positive association. 
So right up there on the top of your paper where it says what kind of association is there, write the word positive. There is a positive association. Now, on the rest of it, I need to still have a label. So what is the label for this going to look like? Like a title is what I meant to say. I'm sorry. It's a label too, but specifically a title. Well, it's got to have the vertical jump heights. And I think we could say for the five starters. Um, after that, if you don't want to say from year 2002 to year 2008, I think that's appropriate because we've got that represented already on the bottom. Um, but we probably need at least that much in terms of a title for it to be reasonable. All right, notice over here where I put years because we're about to enter one more type of a, of a graph. This is years after 2000 because that's what I talked about, right? My vertical axis was the year 2000. So I'm going to put years after 2000 because of where we're shifting to next. Our next question actually, our next type of graph talks about something called a trend line. A trend line is a line that closely fits the data and can be used to describe it. Another phrase for a trend line is called a best fit line. It is a line. It's not like a line graph. We're not connecting the dots. It's actually a line. It's going to go through the data. But the idea is that it's the line that's sort of best representing what the data is doing overall. For example, on this one, my line better be going uphill, right? Because the data goes uphill. So I can't draw just any line. So like this goes through the data, but it doesn't sort of represent the trend of what the data is doing. Does that make sense? So a trend not line, it needs to go through the data something like, like this, where it's sort of smack dab through the middle of it in such a way that it's representing, don't sketch it just yet, just yet, because I'm going to show you how to do it correctly. But this would be the idea of what we're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's actually talk about how we actually draw the trend line then. So this, this is the next example. Example three says, using the data in example two, create a best fit or trend line for the data. And then in part B, it says to estimate an equation for it. So over here, we're trying to sort of balance, it's not exactly true, but we're kind of trying to balance the number of dots above and below. Does that make sense? So when we're looking at this data, we want to sort of take into consideration that, yes, there's some sort of outliers. There's data that sort of seems to be outside of the relative norm of what's going on. Like these two data values at the bottom, the 58 and the 60, and the two data values at the top, maybe that 74 and 70, 75 and 77 that I've got up there, those kind of seem to be a little bit outside the norm. But the rest of them are, are fairly bunched up, right? I mean, they are spread, but they're, they're in sort of a pattern of what's going on. So when we draw our trend line, we're trying to get through the most of the data that we can. So it looked, mine would look something like that. I think that's pretty reasonable. There's a level of accuracy here that we're not trying to attain. If you were in my business calc classes, we do data like this and we get an exact equation and there's a mathematical calculation for how to do so. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to approximate what should be reasonable. Okay, does that make sense? So when I write down my answer for my equation, it's probably not going to be the exact same one that Kayla has or the same one that Kaylee has. Our equations are probably going to be slightly different, but they, do, they need to match your line, whatever your line is. Everybody good so far? Okay, so sketch with your data the way you've drawn it what the best fit line is that you think from your data. And then I'm going to show you how we create the equation for that. And then we'll stop there for today. <clears throat> After you get yours sketched, the first piece of information I want you to look for is where does it cross your y-axis? So mine looks like it crosses at about 59. I'm going to say 59. 
Maybe yours is at about 59, or maybe it's closer to 60, or maybe it's closer to 57. It's okay. But you better be fairly close. I mean, if you're telling me that your line's crossing at 62, we probably need to re-examine whether or not your line makes sense. Okay? It's going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 59. So when we're writing our equation of our line, if you'll remember, a line is y equal mx plus b. That's one, one version of it. It's certainly an acceptable version for what we're doing. And the B is where it's crossing. Mine is 59. Yours is whatever yours is. The other piece of information is that we need to figure out what the slope is. So if you take a look back at your line, you need to find a couple of places on the graph that sort of seem reasonable to estimate slope from. Like in particular, because I've got a grid, it's really nice because I can see the hash marks right. So this one that I circled in green, it's actually a dot on the scatter plot and it crosses at a corner. It's just really nice. Right, so I'm going to use that particular point, and then I'm going to use this point. A couple of places where it's nice to graph from. So if I'm looking at this one, this one is um, 2008, so I'm going to use the number 8, and it's at a height of 72. And I'm going to use this one right here, which is, um, what is that one? It's 2005, and I'm at a height of 67. Those are the values I'm going to pick. So you pick two values from your line. We're going to calculate the slope, and then we'll stop for today, okay? So if you'll remember, slope is the change in y over the change in x. So pick which one you want to be your x1 and x2, and which one you want to be your y1 and y2. I'm going to call this one x1 and x uh, y1, and this one x2 and y2. So if I do y, um, x1, x2 minus x1, this would be 5 minus, I'm sorry, my numerator first. Um, y2 minus y1, this would be 67 minus 72 over 5 minus 8. Mine happen to be both negative because the way I chose my x1 and x2. So this would be negative 5 over negative 3. So mine is about 5 thirds. So about 5 thirds would be as a decimal, and you can use a decimal if you want. It'd be 1.67 if we just use a couple decimal places, right? I didn't mean for that. 1.67. That would be the slope of my line. I'm just going to keep it in 5 thirds, but you can use it as a decimal if you prefer that better. This is not finished. All right? We still need to put some language around this so that it can actually be used. So we'll talk about how we do the language. It talks about the bottom here. It says, note this must contain supporting language, and it doesn't yet. But we will pick up there next time. All right? So homework from 10.2. We'll do questions in class to start with for the first 10 minutes or so. We'll finish this section, and then we'll start 10.4.